Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. Today we're going to be discussing the fall of the Roman Empire and the Dark Ages that subsequently engulfed Europe. Some questions we must address in this documentary are, of course, what caused the mighty Roman Empire to collapse? What was life like in the Dark Ages? How dark were they really, and if they were rather dark, what made them this way? What did people hold on to throughout them, and how did Europe eventually climb out of them? This video today is made possible by the Patreon support of Chris Yates, so thank you again Chris. Now then, let's get to it. Rome, 117 AD. The year of the death of the Emperor Trajan who, building on the efforts of his predecessors which at this time spanned over 800 years, expanded the Roman Empire to its pinnacle. While there is still conflict on the borders, which are the strong emperors who succeed Trajan that same century, such as Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius, will pursue, the empire itself is still in an age of prosperity and relative peace known as Pax Romana, the Roman peace. This is the glorious Roman empire with which we are all familiar. Though it would still stand for centuries to come, and while it was still in the middle of its golden age, the seeds of catastrophe will soon be planted. In 177, the son of Marcus Aurelius, Commodus, became emperor. Commodus broke the chain of strong emperors which Rome had been enjoying that century. He was foolish, cowardly, inept, and outright sociopathic and insane. He ordered his guards to dance naked. He drank in public while dressed like a woman. He had hundreds of female and male sex slaves. But what really angered the Roman elites, known as patricians, were things like human sacrifice, mutilating innocent people, and of course, his participation in gladiator fights. In these mock fights, he would often take on amputees in a very brutal way, just as an example of how he would fight. During this reign, the Roman statesman Cassius Dio would claim that Commodus caused Rome to descend from a kingdom of gold to one of rust and iron, and indeed, many historians agree that Rome's very slow downfall begins with the reign of Commodus. This went on for years until Commodus was finally killed by being strangled while bathing. The Senate, that pretended to love him while he was alive, basically decided to make him a public enemy once he died, and tried to wipe out his memory altogether. But there was not much relief following Commodus' death. Much more common than insane emperors and statesmen in Rome were corrupt and self-serving ones, though plenty of both kinds would come in the centuries which followed. The year of the five emperors would follow his reign. Pertinax, a military leader, was made emperor by the Praetorian Guard, but then the guard killed him within three months. Didus Julianus succeeded him by buying the position, actually, but then he was executed two months later. Civil war in Rome then broke out between two other claimants, Septimius Severus and Perscenius Niger. Septimius would win this war and rule for almost 18 years, but following him was a succession of other corrupt and inept emperors and in fact corrupt and inept officials across the empire in general. So essentially, while the rule of Commodus and the year of the five emperors may have been an unusually desperate time for Rome, it did set the stage for other similar behaviors to follow. Things did not improve in the third century, as Rome entered what is remembered as the crisis of the third century. During this period, along with the aforementioned style of rule being commonplace, Civil war ravaged and divided the empire, foreign armies attacked it, the economy took a major downfall, there was a 13 year plague, and many other troubles plagued Rome. If people hadn't realized it before, they definitely were now starting to realize that Rome was in trouble, and indeed people were concerned that they were facing a complete collapse of the empire, if not the end of the world. In 284, Diocletian became emperor. Diocletian was a low-status soldier born in modern-day Croatia that rose to the ranks of the military and eventually became emperor by defeating other claimants. Diocletian was the first strong emperor Rome had seen in quite a while. He recognized that Rome was in major trouble and intended to reinvigorate the empire. We've discussed already some of the things that were leading to and would eventually finally lead to Rome's collapse entirely. Foreign invasion, civil war, and other domestic struggles for power, economic turmoil, etc. Diocletian thus suggested that the empire remain one single Roman Empire, but be divided administratively. 
Furthermore, Diocletian would break the 50 or so Roman provinces into over a hundred, to ease administration of those as well. These were generally successful reforms, at least temporarily. Many other reforms, such as expanding the army, raising taxes to support that army, trying to stop inflation, and persecuting Christians, were not effective, and many were in fact rather harmful. He had also tried to stop civil war as the means by which new emperors came to power, though after his reign, this method once again became commonplace. Admirably, Diocletian was the first Roman emperor to voluntarily resign, living out his retirement growing cabbages at his home until he died in 311 AD. While splitting the empire helped administratively, financially it was a bad call. The Western Empire was less wealthy but had more financial burdens, namely supporting the military against numerous enemies and nearly constant warfare. Furthermore, as expansion halted over the late 2nd and 3rd centuries, the Western economy, which relied heavily on slave labor from conquered peoples, started to suffer more as well, with fewer slaves obviously available. The wealth of the Western Empire became increasingly concentrated in the elite. Meanwhile, the lower classes struggled increasingly, leading to a loss of cohesion in society. This, along with other factors such as religious intolerance, specifically toward Jews and much more so the rising religion of Christianity, and what many Romans saw as a degradation of their values, would lead to a breakdown of the Roman sense of community. It would be an emperor named Constantine the Great that would attempt to solve many of these issues. While fighting in yet another civil war for the throne in the early 4th century, Constantine claimed to have received one of the most important messages in history. In the sky he saw a cross, a Christian symbol, and heard the words, In hoc signo vinces, by this sign you shall conquer. He then claimed to have a dream in which he was visited by Christ, where he was commanded to fight with the Cairo sign, another Christian symbol. He did so, and in the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, defeated his opponent's army, which outnumbered him two to one. Constantine would enter Rome victoriously, and would later issue the Edict of Milan, along with the Eastern Emperor Licinius. This essentially allowed the worship of Christianity and all other religions across the empire, thus ending centuries of persecution. It also granted back to Christians all the lands which had been taken during Diocletian's persecution. Later, Constantine would defeat Licinius in war, and become emperor of both the west and the east. He would then found a new capital of the east to replace the Greek pagan capital, which symbolized the vision. He would build the city on top of an older city, called Byzantium, and named it after himself, Constantinople. Contrary to popular belief, Constantine did not immediately convert to Christianity. In fact, he spent most of his life officially as a pagan, sort of bouncing around with and working on both religions and drawing symbols from both of them, and that sort of thing. But towards the end of his life, he would convert to Christianity, becoming the first Christian emperor of Rome, thereby shocking much of the world. It would not be long, perhaps only 60 years or so after Constantine's death, that most of Rome converted to Christianity as well. In fact, about 80% of the empire. This was a huge change, and the effects of Constantine's rule are still with us today. Was Christianity, however, beneficial to saving Rome, or did it hasten its downfall? There is debate. Some scholars argue that it led to a breakdown of traditional Roman values. Others argue that traditional Roman values were already breaking down, and that Christianity gave Romans a new necessary focal point in their lives. Regardless, however, of the state religion, Rome still had other problems to face. Throughout the 4th century, the barbarians became a bigger and bigger problem. This, along with increasing financial difficulties, more inept leadership after Constantine the Great, a redivision of the empire, and other problems, started to spell trouble for Rome. In the 4th century, barbarians began encroaching on Roman territory and settling in parts of it, and Rome often lacked the ability to remove them. Eventually, Romans began integrating more and more barbarian soldiers into their armies to maintain their empire. These soldiers were cheaper, but had less loyalty as well. Typically, they had no actual concern for Rome itself, only for their barbarian commander and their people, and of course only cared about their personal gain from being in the army. In the late 4th and early 5th century, a group known as the Huns from the Eurasian steppes began moving westward, displacing many Germanic tribes. These Germanic tribes, primarily Goths, in turn began pushing into Rome, putting more strain on Rome as well. 
The Goths were brought into the Roman Empire but were largely exploited and left to starve, causing them to rebel in 376. This was when Rome started to face serious, irreparable damage. The Romans would eventually win this war, but it would be a Pyrrhic victory, as the Romans had lost a considerable amount, including Valens, the Emperor of the East. Following this war would be two more civil wars, which the Emperor Theodosius would struggle to win. Theodosius died in 395, the last ruler of both the East and West Roman Empire. His sons Honorius and Arcadius would succeed him, but they were essentially also inept rulers gaining the throne of a fractured empire. A Gothic leader, Alaric, would lead another rebellion when the sons of the Emperor Theodosius failed to give him much opportunity of advancement in the Roman army in which he was serving. Honorius failed to adequately respond to the situation, and it was a general Stilicho who was responsible for much of Rome's defense, as in fact Alaric marched on the city of Rome itself. Stilicho would defend Rome and other parts of the crumbling empire, but it would be excessively difficult. He pulled troops out of Britain and urged his soldiers to bring their slaves to fight with them. In 408, Stilicho, a threat to Honorius' power, was executed. Thus died one of the last great Romans. Alaric moved into Italy towards Rome. His forces were starving and he needed food, though the Romans had little themselves. In 410 AD, Alaric sacked the city of Rome. The great city had now fallen to barbarians. Many truly believed that the end of the world had come. It is said that when the Emperor Honorius, who was living in the city of Ravenna, heard the news, he cried out, and yet it had just eaten from my hands. He apparently thought that they meant his favorite chicken, named Roma, was what had perished. Roma is, as I'm sure you can tell, the Latin word for Rome. And when he learned it was a city instead, he was relieved. And in fact, many Roman politicians and aristocrats were completely out of touch, and it came at one of the worst possible times. Alaric and his Visigoths, failing to find much food in Rome, left for greener pastures. Throughout the next few decades, barbarian tribes began settling in Hispania, Britannia, Gaul, North Africa, and other parts of the empire. And the Romans were largely powerless to remove them, and in fact negotiated ways to peacefully integrate them. Barbarian tribes, again primarily Visigoths, would ally themselves with Rome to repel Attila the Hun and his forces, but when he was driven back and died unexpectedly in 453, conflict was back on. Ultimately, the barbarian forces in the Roman army, known as the Federati, would unite under a leader of unknown ethnic background, possibly a Hun, named Odoacer in 476. Odoacer would overthrow the last Roman emperor, ironically named Romulus, that year on September 4th, and proclaim himself King of Italy. After over a thousand years, Rome had now officially collapsed. Romulus, only 16 at the time, was allowed to quietly retire, as Rome's light was extinguished. A key point to take from the fall of Rome was that it was not merely the result of barbarian invasion. It was, firstly, a combination of several factors that weakened Rome significantly. Economically, there were labor shortages from the lack of slave labor, taxation increased heavily, and the money was devalued from inflation. Furthermore, much of this tax money went to fund the military, and infrastructure was ignored. And the division between the West and East, which temporarily helped, ultimately would cause the two sides to grow apart, leaving the Western Empire, which was less wealthy and had more enemies, weakened. Furthermore, as if administration of the empire wasn't hard enough, it was being overseen by a number of corrupt and self-serving emperors and elites. A large number of Roman emperors were assassinated by competitors. Others had to fight civil wars for the throne, and others, having achieved it, behaved selfishly, incompetently, or sometimes rather like Caligula or Commodus. There was a similar situation of ineptitude and apathy in the Senate as well. And furthermore, with the weakened government, the wealthier class was able to flee to the countryside and avoid taxation and participation in the state. It was this society which the barbarian tribes that would ultimately cause Rome's downfall found. A rather important distinction, however, was that they did not all invade Rome, in the traditional sense. Rome faced many invasions which crippled it, especially in later centuries, but many other incidents viewed as invasions were really revolts. The Gothic Wars of 376, for example, was a revolt undertaken by the Goths who had been, I don't want to say welcomed, but legally brought into the empire and allowed to settle. 
Alaric and Odoacer weren't foreign invaders. They were both Latin-speaking members of the Roman army, but they and their soldiers were barbarian in origin and had no real connection to the empire beyond the superficial opportunity. And thus, with the fall of the Roman Empire, Europe and, well, the Western world in general really falls into what historians call the Early Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. But while the Dark Ages are painted as a regressive, unstable, anarchic, fearful, primitive time, the story of this age is very complicated. Society did regress in many ways. For many people living in the times, the world was comparatively darker than it had been in the past, for reasons which we will discuss. But there was also a lot going on in this time. There were many important and great moments in history which took place in an age which historians may unfairly scorn sometimes. In the decades following the fall of Rome, a number of things happen. Multiple successor kingdoms arise in the old territories of the empire. This is the map of Europe in the year 500, 24 years after Rome fell. As you can see, the kingdoms formed by the Visigoths, the Franks, the Ostrogoths, the Anglo-Saxons, and the Burgundians are some of the most important kingdoms following Rome's fall. Most of these successor kingdoms are led by Germanic tribes whom the Romans considered barbarians. Now, there is a portrayal of these kingdoms being formed by savages living in huts after having burned down Roman civilization, but many of these kingdoms actually kind of built on top of Rome, they worked with Roman aristocracy, they were in many ways Roman. A good example of this was Odoacer's Kingdom of Italy, actually. Odoacer would naturally make an effort to depose of his Roman competitors, but the Roman Senate would actually continue to function during his reign and he drew on their support for a large amount of power. And this state would gradually join the Ostrogothic Kingdom as time went on, which in many ways was as well Roman. Furthermore, many of these so-called barbarians were, as I discussed earlier, rather Romanized. They spoke varieties of Latin, which would slowly evolve into other languages like French, Italian, and Spanish. Many followed the Roman religion of Christianity, though for many it was Arian Christianity, which was slightly different from the Catholic Christianity of Rome. Regardless, the Arian Christians in Italy still heavily respected the Catholic Church, centered in the city of Rome. Many would say that Rome never truly fell all the way, but instead, it survived in the Latin-speaking Catholic Church. During the 500s, the Franks began moving westward from modern-day Belgium into the rest of modern France. Their leader, Clovis, unified the Frankish tribes, effectively laying the foundations for the modern nation of France and the Merovingian dynasty, which was to rule it. He ruled from a city called Paris, which would now serve as the capital of his people up to the modern day. Clovis also converted to Christianity, becoming one of the first northern Germanic kings to do so, and he required that his subjects convert as well, laying the foundation for Catholicism to spread throughout Europe. As Europe became increasingly fragmented, times became harder. The Franks, however, were politically unable to form a large, powerful successor state because of inheritance laws. When Clovis died, his conquests were divided again between his four sons. Control over power during such divisions across Europe would be the main cause for large amounts of conflict that marked the Dark Ages. In fact, in Merovingian France in particular, there were very constant civil wars. We may have a hard time imagining how this many civil wars could be erupting, but the concept of the state as we understand it today was not yet present in Europe in this period of history. The perspective of the time was that the country belonged essentially to the king. While post-Roman Europe was modeled on the skeleton of the Roman Empire in important ways, as time passed it became more and more clearly really just a skeleton. Trade and infrastructure broke down relatively quickly. In the past, the Mediterranean was a Roman lake which connected distant lands, allowing trade to flourish. Now, the trade systems broke down as the roads fell into disuse and the countryside and seas became dangerous places. Much of Europe returned to the more localized agricultural societies that predated the Roman Empire. When Rome fell and warfare and plundering of cities became more constant, lower class workers, both Roman and barbarian, fled to the countryside to escape it, and made deals with Roman land-owning aristocrats. In exchange for work, Roman aristocrats offered to house and defend them, a system which would evolve into the feudal systems that dominated medieval Europe. While we can debate and discuss the validity of the term Dark Ages, there are many very obviously dark features of this post-Roman world. 
As a result of all the changes we just discussed, European societies became much smaller places. Throughout the centuries following Rome, education naturally also fell with infrastructure and societal stability. Throughout much of the early ages, only about 1% of the population, mostly the clergy, could read. Life expectancy dropped, the population dropped, forests started to grow back, and Europe became an eerily empty place. Roman ruins were often stripped for building supplies. The Colosseum in Rome served for a time as a landfill. The drop in education and the spreading of information allowed for distant lands to become mysteries again. People were regularly nervous about invaders or plunderers whom they didn't see coming arriving suddenly on the scene. The mysterious forests and countrysides, which were indeed dangerous places, also became the subjects of folktales. And the early Middle Ages were a source of many myths and folktales and such things, with which we are still familiar today. People told tales of goblins, fairies, witches, sorcerers, the dead, etc. And many of those tales still last to this day, in certain cases as original tales, but at least generally in form, you know, something like the Lord of the Rings, for example, while it was written in the 20th century, much of it was based off of Dark Age European mythology. Life was not all bad for these peoples, but certainly, as they lived among the ruins of Rome, even the most uneducated had an understanding that they were living in a degraded world compared to the past. While these kingdoms worked to succeed Rome and the West, in the East, the light of Rome continued to shine. The Eastern Roman Empire did not fall with the West. Rather, it evolved into the Byzantine Empire. And though they were Greek-speaking and much more Eastern than Western, they continued to view themselves as Romans for the next thousand years which Byzantium stood. On August 1st, 527, the Emperor Justinian came to the throne. Justinian the Great, as he came to be called, had very clear intentions, which he called Renovatio Imperi, the restoration of the empire. At this point in history, Rome had only been gone for about 50 years, and Justinian intended to bring it back by reconquering Roman territory lost to the barbarians. After making a peace with the Shah of the Sassanid Persians through bribes, he turned his forces westward. The general Belisarius invaded the North African Vandal lands and subdued them within a year, bringing them into the empire. Next, he turned his attention to the lands of the Ostrogoths. Unfortunately for him, he found much less success there. It took 20 years, rather, to subdue them, and it was a very debilitating campaign for both sides, and in the end, though Italy had been reconquered, much of it was ruined from the conflict. The city of Rome, for example, had been sacked five times throughout these wars, firmly bringing them into the darkness of the Dark Ages. Along with this failure, and it was a considerable failure, it would cost Byzantium around 300,000 pounds of gold to rebuild Italy, and war with the Persians resumed. Justinian also had a rude awakening in discovering that the societal structure of Rome had essentially fallen apart at this time, and that rebuilding it in the West after all this time was much more of a difficult prospect than he had realized. Though Byzantium held on to the territories, and it seemed Rome was making a comeback of sorts, a plague then suddenly struck Byzantium, known as the Plague of Justinian. This plague was one of the worst in history. It killed 13% of the world's population, or about half the population of the Byzantine Empire within a year. Imagine the effects of half the people you know dying within a year. This is what Justinian was facing on an empire-wide scale, and he himself was eventually struck with the plague. He was one of the fortunate ones to survive it, but it left him scarred and he became increasingly erratic, tyrannical, and paranoid. Moreover though, it left the empire scarred. And though Justinian brought about great things with Byzantium, culture, learning, art, architecture like the Hagia Sophia, etc., the empire was far too irreparably damaged by this plague to realistically rebuild the Roman Empire. It would not be long until Byzantium slowly started to lose the lands that it conquered, as well as some of its own original lands as well. The Lombards would start taking control of northern Italy, and later the Persians, Avars, Bulgarians, Slavs, etc. would close in on the empire as well. Byzantium gradually contracted. In 626, Constantinople was besieged by Persians and Avars. The Byzantines would win, but these wars were indeed fracturing the empire. And this fracturing would leave the empire too weak to defend against what would be the greatest enemy of the Byzantine Empire. In the 630s, Arabic followers of a new religion, Islam, began their quest for world empire. 
They found both Byzantium and Persia too weakened to withstand their assaults and, within a decade, had spread into Egypt, Iran, and the border of Anatolia. By 700 AD, the Umayyad Caliphate stretched from North Africa to Afghanistan, overtaking the Persians and most of Byzantium's non-European territory. The Islamic Golden Age began while much of Europe existed in the aforementioned state in the 8th century, and the peoples of this region, Arabs, North Africans, Persians, etc., took up science, history, linguistics, medicine, literature, philosophy, mathematics, and many other fields of education. As Europe was still ruled under fragmented successor states, the Arabs began pushing into Hispania and closer towards Constantinople, eventually besieging it in 717. The siege of Constantinople was a failure, however, and it would leave the Arabs weakened. Entering Hispania, however, was not a failure. Throughout the 8th century, the Umayyads would move into modern-day Spain and Portugal, conquering the territories of the Visigothic Kingdom and beginning Islamic rule of the peninsula that would last for centuries. Meanwhile, in the Frankish Empire, things were changing. The Merovingian dynasty was losing power, and Muslim forces were moving in across the Pyrenees into modern France. Standing in their way, however, was someone whom the Franks would call Charles Martel. Martel was Old French for hammer. Charles the Hammer and the Umayyads would meet at the Battle of Tours on October 10th, 732. There, the Franks would score a decisive victory over the Muslims, killing 12,000, including the enemy commander, while taking only 1,000 or so losses. The Pope hailed Martel as having saved Europe from Muslim domination, as they would never attempt to invade Europe from the Pyrenees again. Following this battle, Martel's power would grow enormously. The position as king might seem a natural next step, however, he was ultimately unable and unwilling to take that position. Instead, he organized himself to hold power and rule from the background, while Theuderic of the Merovingian dynasty held the official title. This was, again, mainly due to the importance the Franks placed on tradition, and though the monarchy was much less powerful than it had been, they were still unwilling to do something such as overthrowing the monarchy. They felt it might anger God, that it would be a front to their heritage and identity as a people, etc., and Martel knew his people would not support him for this reason. It would be his son, rather, Pepin the Short, who would overthrow the Merovingians and begin the Carolingian dynasty in France. He did this through the intervention of the only person the Franks felt was higher than their king, the Pope. The Pope claimed Pepin's ascension to the throne was an act of God, and few therefore contested it. In turn, King Pepin would give the church lands which would become the Papal States, known as the Donation of Pepin. When Pepin died in 768, his son Charles would succeed him. Charles I would become one of the most important rulers of the age, earning the title the Great, or as he is often called, Charlemagne. Charlemagne is sometimes called Pater Europae, the father of Europe, because of his many efforts to reinvigorate and unite Europe. After his brother died, he would unite his Frankish kingdom. He would then invade northern Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, part of Eastern Europe, and even extend into the Balkans and part of Spain and above all, he would have a lot of success in doing so. He would fight all throughout his life to achieve this. Along with territorial and political aspirations, Charlemagne, with the support of the Pope, was also heavily preoccupied with spreading Christianity. Charlemagne insisted that the Saxons of modern-day Germany convert to Catholicism, and those who refused were killed. In one example, 4,500 Saxons were executed in what is remembered as the Massacre of Verden. Accordingly, much of his empire rapidly became Christianized. Charlemagne sought not only to expand his empire, but to enlighten it from within as well. And so he wasn't concerned only with bringing political and religious unity to Europe, but made efforts to restore Europe to the intellectual, social, cultural, and infrastructural power of the Roman days, to the point at which his reign is often called the Carolinian Renaissance. He would divide his empire into a number of counties, and would constantly travel throughout Europe to make sure his subordinates were following his orders. In an age when only around 1% of the population could read, Charlemagne insisted education was the key to revitalizing Europe. He himself learned how to read and demanded it of other officials and statesmen. He built schools across the continent which increased educational opportunities not only for the wealthy, but even the lower classes as well. This fire of learning which spread throughout Europe would help the continent restore trade and infrastructure. 
The unity Charlemagne had achieved, furthermore, allowed for distant trade and such things to be realistic again, and the roads were prioritized and guarded. Charlemagne had united much of Europe, Christianized it, brought education and learning to it, rebuilt its infrastructure, and on the whole improved life for those within his nation. On Christmas Day in the year 800, as Charlemagne knelt at the altar to pray at Mass in St. Peter's Basilica, Pope Leo III placed a crown on his head and proclaimed him Emperor of Rome. There is debate, actually, about whether or not Charlemagne knew that this was going to happen. He later claimed that if he did know, he wouldn't have even gone into the church, but most historians find it hard to believe that he had no idea that this was going to happen, and in fact, he didn't exactly dislike the title considering in official documents, he preferred to be styled Carolus Serenissimus Augustus Adeo Coronatus Magnus Pacificus Imperator Romanum Gubernans Imperium, meaning Charles, most serene Augustus, crowned by God, the great peaceful emperor ruling the Roman Empire. As one might expect, the Byzantines were not very fond of this. They tended to regard Western Europeans as uneducated, uncivilized, barbarian usurpers, and more importantly, the Empress Irene of Byzantium considered herself the ruler of Rome, not this Frankish barbarian Charlemagne. Now, this was much more than just a petty debate over a title. It was another example of strain between Byzantium and the Catholic Church. This, along with conflict over land claims in Italy, would lead to a war between Byzantium and Charlemagne, but it would end with land agreements and the Byzantines recognizing Charlemagne as emperor, though not exactly emperor of Rome. As time went on, however, the divide between East and West would only deepen. While it seemed like Europe was beginning a streak of recovery, external and internal forces would begin to wreak havoc on Charlemagne's empire. Western Europe was about to be enclosed upon on three sides. From the south, Islamic North African pirates would begin raiding and plundering Southern Europe. From the east, a terrifying wave of nomadic warriors from Asia, known as the Magyars, would begin pushing in, and from the north, Perhaps the most fearsome of all, a group of pagan Scandinavian raiders known as the Vikings would seek plunder and opportunity in Europe. Charlemagne would go to war with the Danish Vikings in 808, but made peace in 811. I have done an in-depth documentary on the Vikings already on my channel, as a matter of fact, but essentially, the Vikings were, as I said, a group of Scandinavian raiders from modern-day Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. They descended on Europe in the late 8th century. On June 8, 793, on an island known as Lindisfarne in the Kingdom of Northumbria in modern-day England, a group of raiders assaulted an undefended abbey, slaughtering and enslaving anyone in their way. This was not necessarily the first Viking raid in history, but it is perhaps the most notable, as it marked the beginning of the Viking Age. Terror spread throughout Europe of the brutal Northmen. Why the Vikings came is still a matter of debate. The Vikings were, as I said, pagans, and the pagan Saxons, who had been slaughtered by Charlemagne earlier, were just south of Denmark, so they may have felt concerned about the violent spread of Christianity, and they certainly, as a result, did not like the Franks. There was also perhaps a population boom at this time in Scandinavia, and there were an excess number of landless men, as a result. A main factor, however, was likely simply because they could. Europe was becoming wealthier at this time, and opportunity for plunder started displaying itself, especially on coastal cities and cities along rivers. The Vikings, through their advanced naval technology, exploited this opportunity, attacking coasts and even sailing up rivers with large groups of men, namely with the longboat design which was unheard of prior to this point. The sailing abilities of the Vikings meant, simply, nowhere was safe. They could sail inland to France and Germany, they could sail to distant lands, going as far as North Africa and Byzantium, but their favorite target was right next to home, the British Isles. As islands, very few locations on the British Isles were more than just a few days' march from the sea, and as the Viking Age progressed, there would be more and more Viking influence in Britain and Ireland. A few years later, in 814, in the face of all this chaos, Charlemagne died at the age of 71. Charlemagne had had four sons, and throughout his life expected he would have to divide his empire among them. Unfortunately for him, but fortunately for the Carolingian Empire, only one of them, Louis, outlived him, and the empire passed to him. 
However, regardless, much of Louis's reign was marked by civil war and conflict, and when he died, his empire was divided among his sons in the year 843, three years after his death. In the west, the territory would be ruled by Charles, in the east, Louis, and in the center, Lothar. These divisions would form the basis of France, Germany, and the Low Countries in such places that remain to this day. The division between these kings only encouraged the enemies of Christian Europe. The Vikings would increase their raids, Muslims would increase their plundering, taking slaves and loot and such things as well, and the Magyars closed in. In some places, people were hit by all three of these foes. In such times, when the central political figures of Europe were divided in war, people would turn to the protection of the local nobles, marking some of the beginnings of standard European feudalism. In 865, the Vikings took a new step to their approach. A great army of Vikings landed on the coast of Northumbria, an Anglo-Saxon kingdom in modern-day England. Known to the Anglo-Saxons as the Great Heathen Army, they did not come to raid, but in fact to settle, gradually absorbing lands in England starting with the city of York, which they called Jorvik. Gradually, the Anglo-Saxon lands would fall to the Danelaw. Standing against them, however, was the ruler of the Kingdom of Wessex in southern England, named Alfred. In time, he would become to known as the Great. He would spend much of his reign in conflict with the Vikings, but he would save the last free kingdoms of England from Viking rule, though much of the island would remain under Norse rule for centuries. In the late 9th and early 10th centuries, the Magyars would begin to form a kingdom in central eastern Europe, a nation which would come to be known as Hungary. This kingdom would plunder Europe for decades to come, invading both the western and eastern world and becoming a specific nuisance to the East Franks, as well as the Bulgarians and the Byzantines. In 955, however, as the Magyars pressed further into lands that would become Germany, the king, Otto I, would oppose them. He met them at the Battle of Lechfeld that year. Under Otto's command was a new type of soldier, heavy cavalry, an important force in standing up against the horse warriors of the Magyars. This heavy cavalry would go on to form the foundation of medieval knights. Otto would win, repelling the Hungarians and, in the eyes of Catholic Europe, being a defender of Christendom. As Otto continued to work to unite the German tribes and expand his empire, he would be crowned in a similar manner as Charlemagne by the Pope, being titled Holy Roman Emperor. Thus, the Holy Roman Empire was born. Meanwhile, the Vikings, often regarded as destroyers of Europe, were in many other ways giving birth to parts of it, and going far beyond what their opponents were doing. Many would integrate into European societies and convert to Catholicism. In France, in order to appease the Vikings, the king would give them land on the northern part of the country, which would come to be known as the Land of the Northmen, or Normandy. These Normans, after integrating with the French, would go on to conquer England a century later, and lay the foundations for the English monarchy there. Having the greatest naval technology in Europe, they would go on to explore and settle distant lands, reaching Iceland, Greenland, and even North America, discovering it centuries before Columbus. In Eastern Europe, the Vikings would come to claim territory and rule a Slavic people as nobility. These Vikings, known as the Rus, would lay the foundations for modern Russia. Even as far east as Byzantium, the Emperor of Constantinople, observing their military prowess, hired them to be his personal bodyguard, known as the Varangian Guard. Ironically, the Vikings, who brought such darkness in Europe, in the end would help bring it out of that darkness into the higher Middle Ages which followed. Ultimately, however, the truly most unifying force in medieval Europe, for perhaps good and bad, was Christianity and the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church would stamp out ideas which contradicted its doctrine, but it would also be responsible for encouraging the return of education to Europe. The church would heavily persecute those who did not fall into their line of thought, but oftentimes that meant persecuting rapists, thieves, murderers, and other nefarious people. Leaders would be held under a degree of rule from the Catholic Church, which was, in plenty of circumstances, a self-interested organization. The Catholic Church was also instrumental in restricting self-interested rulers and nobility, and held them to a standard of decency and morality. The Catholic Church would encourage the code of chivalry among Europeans which turned the medieval knight from a barbarian thug into a servant of piety and morality. 
We can debate the effects that religion, and especially religious organizations, have on people, especially in times like the Dark Ages, and we can even call into question how much good and bad that the Catholic Church did in this time was really in the name of religion, or if it was out of a self-interested plot, but in the end, I think it would be fair to say that the Catholic Church played a significant role of bringing Europe out of the Dark Ages. In the eyes of some historians, Europe would not return to the same level of appreciation and dignity until the Renaissance. But around the beginning of the 11th century, the Dark Age of the medieval world was coming to a close. Trade and infrastructure were returning to former grandeur. Art and architecture took off. Modern nation-states, notably England, France, Poland, and Denmark, saw their foundations in this time. And with those nations came the concept of the state, and the power which they would come to wield. The First Crusades would reintroduce Europe to the intellectual achievements of antiquity and the Islamic Golden Age, which were crucial in pulling Europe from the Middle Ages altogether and into the modern world. A modern world which, by the 11th and 12th centuries, was beginning to come into sight. As for the Roman Empire, it would never truly rise again. The Byzantine Empire would survive until the 15th century when Constantinople was finally captured by the Muslim Ottoman Empire. In Europe, many, from the Holy Roman Empire to Napoleonic France to Mussolini's Italy, would claim to be the return of the Roman Empire. And though none would ever be truly Roman, the legacy of the Romans would last up through the modern day. But while Rome laid the foundations for much of Europe, and significant parts of the world in fact, we should not forget that many other important foundations lie in the efforts of the people who pushed through and survived a very dark age. At this time, I'd like to thank Jonathan Trillo for his Patreon support. For more videos like this, and videos on many other subjects, be sure to check out Fire of Learning and subscribe. Thank you for watching.